Amen. We've got to wait for us all to get up here. All right, let's all stand. We're going to sing the first Noel. <clears throat> For offertory, we're going to sing O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
Well, good morning. I welcome you to the Lord's house here at Heads Free Will Baptist Church. Glad to see some unfamiliar faces, but that's the case every week for me. I'm trying to figure out everybody and then families in and we welcome you for going in, coming in for time of Thanksgiving with your family. And of course, there may be others here who are visitors. We're glad to welcome each of you to our service today. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, it is a joy to gather together with family during the Thanksgiving holiday. I pray we all had that opportunity or will do so over these next few days, even as some are celebrating in other places. And uh, we pray that you might help them as they travel back here to us. Others may be leaving here, traveling back home to other states today and other locations. I pray your richest blessings to be upon them. But Thanksgiving, most of all, is not just a time to commune with one another, but it's the time to give glory to you. For you have blessed us beyond anything we could ever actually deserve. Lord, you are gracious and good God. You have met our needs, even through the difficulties we faced. You have been there with us, and we give you glory today. We ask that you might be with us and have it the praises of your people as we worship you today. Uh, bless us now as we continue, Lord. May this service and all that we say and do be dedicated to the name of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, let's all stand for our last song, O Come, All Ye Faithful. <clears throat> Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. Even though uh, we have partially started to decorate, Miss Lisa and Perry have the flu, so she said, uh, I will come back and finish it up. She wanted you to know that's not just how the trees will be. They'll have some decorations and ornaments on them. So, but uh, I will start Christmas messages next week as we get into December. So today... We're going to look at, do all roads lead to heaven? From Acts chapter 4, at the very middle, we're going to look at verses 10 through 12. It will be our passage today. Acts chapter 4, 
verse 10, the word of the Lord. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the man, or excuse me, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which the, was rejected by the builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. And then the most important verse here, he says, nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God, it stands forever. When I was a kid, we would often go on vacations, usually one of two places, either the beach or the mountains. My dad's favorite place was the Smoky Mountains and still is to this day. This is the place that he liked to go and take us. And I was always amazed, at least as a very young kid, when I watched my dad navigate and get us to the location that we were going. One, I was so young and I was, didn't know how to navigate and I just thought it was kind of innate within him. Now he always had a sense of direction that was better than most, but it was not that innate. I mean, I found out one day he had the Rosetta Stone that helped him to be the kind of navigator he was and that is called a map. Now this was long before you have your smartphones, your GPS that some of you are so attached to, you don't know any other way except to type in the location where you want to go. And it literally tells you, take a ride up here. Usually for me, I'm a little too fast and I've already passed the location I need to turn right, but it's time to tell you. We old people, y'all know who you are, remember getting out the old fashioned paper map, right? And you had to get it out ahead of time. You had to figure out, okay, this is where I want to go. How do I get there? And uh, sometimes you had to do that on the fly. You were in the car and something changes and you've got to have a navigator. Somebody's got to pull out the map because the driver, you certainly don't want to text or look at a phone and drive, hint, hint. I know the habit all of us have, but especially you didn't want to pull out this gigantic map. And those of us who have used the old paper map know Thank, you know, pray to God that you can get this thing folded back in the proper way. You know, just wad it up best you could to stick it back in there. But you discovered for yourself, if you try to get to your destination, there are many routes that you could take. Some more preferable than others. And there was often one route that was really considered the best route. And everybody said, this is the best way in order to get to the location you're going. I think much like navigating in a, on a physical map to a destination, people apply that same logic, I think, to getting to heaven. Heaven is that ultimate location that we all want to arrive at. Webster's Dictionary defines heaven as the dwelling place of the deity, or we would say God, and uh, the blessed dead. This is the dwelling place of God and the blessed dead a place of utmost happiness, a place that we all want to go to. Theologian Wayne Grudem defines it this way. Heaven is the place where God most fully makes known his, pleasance, his presence to bless. Uh, Wayne Grudem as a theologian, Christian theologian, wants to point out that God dwells everywhere, not just in heaven, but that's the place where we think about his presence most blessing us, the place that we want to end up at. And again... How do we get there? If that's the destination, how do we get there? The world thinks that there are many routes, many roads, many ways in order to get to heaven. We are living in a very pluralistic society, now more than ever in America. So many other cultures and so many other mindsets and people have come in. There are a lot of different ways of thinking. And when it comes to our culture and the diversity is certainly seen even within the context of religious beliefs, right? There are a lot of different religions represented in the context of America. And most of them in some form or some fashion talk about some heaven and all claim to provide ways in order to get to heaven. 
to this paradise, this place that we ultimately want to get to. And there may be some that are more preferable than others, the world thinks. There may be some that are considered the best route, but most people believe all of these roads eventually will get you to the same location, will get you to paradise, will get you to heaven. And that's what the secular mindset thinks. All roads lead to heaven. And you are Christians, you argue about this thing, and we shouldn't be arguing about this because they're all equal and equally valid. Some may be more considered best than others, but they all lead to the same location. But the Bible, it stands in stark contrast to this mindset. It, mo- it makes some of the most exclusive claims concerning how to get to heaven. Right? Notice our text this morning. In the context, Peter is standing before the Sanhedrin, which is the highest adjudicating body within Israel. And he makes some pretty exclusive claims, doesn't he? He he puts us in mind. Of course, this guy has been healed. There's arguments about his healing. And he says, uh, let it be known to all of you all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, the the apostles by this time are going to always couch their teachings about Jesus, about the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ, as the church should do today. This man stands before you whole, healed completely. He's not only talking about physical sense, but spiritual sense through Christ. And this is the stone that has been rejected by the builders, but it is the chief cornerstone. It's the central piece of our faith. Then he makes this very outrageous claim, especially in the world in which we live in today. There is salvation can't be found in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The apostle Peter is telling us very clearly, isn't he? That Jesus is the only way to heaven how do we get to heaven he says through christ and christ alone but peter of course wasn't the only one the apostles were all teaching this and where did they get this teaching from they got it from jesus himself didn't they i mean this is something that jesus taught back in john 14 6 jesus said i am the way the truth and the life No one comes to the Father. No one makes it to heaven except through me. Pretty audacious claim. Certainly a controversial statement. See, these statements and others hit at the heart of this notion that all these religions out here are the same. All these religions lead us to heaven. We just need to pick the one that's favorite to us. It shatters all these kinds of myths that the world has today. I want to address three myths that stand in the way of our understanding of the one true route to heaven and make it crystal clear that Jesus is the only way. The first myth, all religions are the same. All religions are the same. Many people are upset with the exclusive claims by Jesus and Christianity that Christ is the only means of salvation. There are a lot of things that they don't like about us as Christians, right? But this is probably the biggest one. That we claim that Christ is the only way, the only means to get us to heaven. Our culture likes options, don't we? We like to go to the restaurant and those restaurants that give us the most options we look forward to going to, have it your way. I know that's the Burger King slogan, but every restaurant could have it that way, right? Have that kind of slogan. We all want it our way. We go into a restaurant the more, the better to choose from, even though that means we're going to sit there longer and look at the menu and have to wrestle with what we want. And then you're going to end up getting the same thing anyway, by the way. Uh, but when it comes to religions, don't they all lead to the same place? Right? That's what the world says. Dad often took different routes when traveling to the places. Sometimes he was in a hurry and he'd go the most direct route in order to get to the place. Or sometimes he'd take the scenic route. You know, that was the long way around. It'd take a little bit longer. Things he wanted to see, wanted to stop at. 
Many of these religions seem to be culturally defined in our world today. And uh, with pluralism, what it teaches is that uh, all cultures, all ideas, all religions are equal. That's one of the foundational teachings in our uh, pluralistic, everybody get along tolerant, quote, culture, right? Every religion is valid. How dare you Christians come along and then say there is only one way. You are already excluding all these other religions of the world. What about all these cultures and people that have not heard? And you're saying that they can't go to heaven because they have not even heard of the name of Christ. And that's kind of the common thing in people's mindsets. Well, don't you all teach the same morality? You may come at it in a different way, but again, you're all teaching the same morality. You may be different, but it's the same that way. I've heard that argument so many times from people. We are all teaching the same thing. And you're saying, no, we're not. You know little to nothing about religion and Christianity if you think that. There are some major differences between us as Christians and the religions of the world. For one, the uniqueness of Christianity is rooted in the uniqueness of Jesus himself. Other religious leaders promise to help you find truth and salvation. Jesus says that he is truth and salvation. Again, back to our statement from Jesus himself in John 14. He said, I. He didn't say, I know the way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way. He's the way to the Father. He is the way to heaven. Jesus is the truth. He is the reality of God's promises. And Jesus is the life as he joins us to his divine life and ours, both now and eternally. He is encompassing it all. Another major difference is that unlike other religions, Christianity proclaims a gospel of grace and not of works. So not only are we unique and unique as Christ is, but also we're proclaiming a gospel of grace and not of works. This is significant since every other religion is based on someone doing something in order to earn heaven or divine favor or grace. Islam has five tenets that you have to do in your lifetime. Hinduism has karma. It's all about kind of a do-it-yourself proposition. Here's some things, and we like that kind of thing, right? That's kind of the fits into what we do in just the normal day activities in life. I got to do this in order to earn this. I go to work tomorrow in order to earn a paycheck that I get at the end of the week. So that sounds logical that that should be the case when it comes to religion. I do these things in order to please that deity and earn my way into heaven. See, but Christianity comes along and teaches just the opposite. God reaches down to us who were incapable of reaching up to him. We're fixing to go into the Christmas season. And that's the whole point of the incarnation of Christ. It's not that we're just gathering here to celebrate a baby, but it is God, as we were singing in a moment ago, Emmanuel, God with us, coming down to us, humbling himself, becoming obedient, even to the point of death, the death of the cross, so that he might pay for our sins. He might earn us the grace. It's, it's not us. It's Christ. That's why it's the gift of God that he offers us. In 1 John 4, 10, this is out of the New Living Translation, it puts it this way. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. It's true love. You think of the life you've lived, the sins that you've done. Christ came and paid for your sin, for my sin. Not because we all of a sudden just had earned his favor. We could not earn his favor. We couldn't do enough. And yet, that's God. That's Christianity's teachings, the God of grace. Let me illustrate this stark 
contrast by using the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son as an illustration. Why do I use this illustration? Because the Buddhists have something very similar as one of their stories. Both have sons who become rebellious and leave home. Both find their way back home to their families after they hit rock bottom and come to their senses. Both fathers love their sons and have been looking for them. Here's a few differences in the Buddha story. It's been 50 years since the son has been missing and he returns home. But here's the biggest contrast. What happens after they return home? Do you remember the biblical story? In the prodigal son, he returns home after wasting his inheritance on his riotous living, the King James says, and he returns home realizing, I'm not worthy. But I know my father is gracious and he may just let me come in and be like one of his hired hands. They are doing more, better off than I am. And so he comes home and he's, his father sees him a long way off and, and does something that Jewish men just didn't do at that time. He, he takes off and he runs to greet his son and embraces his son with grace and love and compassion and says, bring him in. My son who is lost is now found. It's the picture of salvation that God offers to all of us. We love him, as the passage said a moment ago, because he first loved us. He pursues us. And God graciously gives to this son who has wandered away from him life and puts on the best robe and brings him back into the family. Now, here's where the Buddha story is different. In that story, the father does not reveal his identity to his son. Certainly not in the beginning. And he makes his son work for 20 years in order to earn back his favor and to pay back all the stuff that he wasted. What a big difference between a graceless religion, Buddhism, and Christianity. A God says who recognizes we could never earn his grace. We could never do enough. But that's the love and compassion of our God who embraces us and brings us to himself when we repent of our sins and come and trust in him. What a difference. All religions are not the same. Be clear on that. Jesus is unique, and because of that, Christianity is set apart as unique, filled with grace. The second myth, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. So the first myth is all about, well, we all get there, right? All roads lead to heaven. No, they're all different. Only one leads to heaven, Christianity, true biblical Christianity. The second one, well, it doesn't matter as long as you believe sincerely your belief, even if it's wrong. People have this misconception. People who have this misconception may admit that Christianity is different among other religions. But they still feel that it's just one valid philosophy among many. That certainly permeates in our culture and society, right? You have your truth and I have mine. So as long as you believe your truth, that's fine, but I'm going to believe my truth. And it's just as valid and equal. That's a part of that you know, toleration that we quote unquote have today. Everyone's viewpoint is equally valid. And we as Americans have it written into our Constitution. The Bill of Rights allows our citizens to believe in any religious viewpoint. They're equally protected. Christianity is not the religion of America sanctified in the Constitution. It's not. Every religion is protected. And because of this protection, people jump to the, I think, erroneous conclusion that all religions must be equally true. Right? The U.S. Constitution doesn't make a judgmental call on the truthfulness of any one religion over another. We in America believe in the freedom of choice that way. And all religions are protected in that sense in America. And that's why we are the beacon of freedom where people around the world want to come into America legally and illegally. All over the place trying to get into our country. Because they see it as a place of protection. And we should be proud of that as Americans. But I'm here to tell you, as far as Christianity is concerned, just because millions of people believe a religion or a philosophy doesn't mean it's right. It isn't judged on 
how many people believe it to make it right or not. And it doesn't matter how hard or sincere you believe it either. You can sincerely believe in something that is false and believe yourself into hell. Well, I sincerely believe this is true. Well, what makes Jesus' statement true? And the apostles' teaching on that statement. Well, Jesus authenticated who he was by living the perfect life, fulfilling prophecy, performing all these miracles, and hey, the coup de grace, rising from the dead. I mean, that's the clincher, right? That's what ultimately sets Christianity apart. Remember, it's not Easter, you say, brother, but the church is always thinking about Easter, the resurrection, because Paul said, uh, hey, if Jesus had not come back from the dead, we're still in our sins and we are the most miserable people because we're wasting time here. But he has. Jesus didn't just claim to be the son of God. I think overwhelmingly he proved it. As you look at his life, read what the scriptures teach. The third myth. Christians are narrow-minded to think Jesus is the only way to heaven. Those who believe this would be right to feel this way if there were more than one road leading to heaven. If, if there are, all religions are valid, all religions are equal, all religions are leading you to heaven, then we would be narrow-minded if we come in here and said, this is the one and only road that you can take in order to get to heaven. But there are no other ways. And so what the apostles are teaching us, and now we as the church are teaching today, if we're going to be biblical, that Jesus is our only means of salvation, is not narrow-minded, it's compassionate. To tell the sinner that there is eternal life to be found and it's found in Christ is compassion, folks. It's not mean-spirited, no matter what the world tells us. Let me put it this way. What if your doctor knew of a cure to some major issue that you were facing and he or she didn't tell you about this cure? Would they be considered compassionate? You're thinking, that if they just ignored it and said, well, there are all kinds of ways you can deal with this, even though they know there is one way that will fix it. Well, let me put it on this other, on its head and ask it this way. Would you consider a doctor who helped you with the cure to be narrow-minded? If they said, this is your problem, this is the cure, this is what we need to do. You would not think them narrow-minded, you would think them compassionate and doing their job to fix you, to help you. Well, Jesus is the only cure for your problem and for my problem. We are dead, folks, in our trespasses and sins. We have no hope of gaining heaven as our home. We cannot be good enough. We cannot be righteous enough. We cannot earn God's favor. And only through Christ, who has met God's standard perfectly... Died and our place as our sacrifice can be the one who provides us the means of salvation in heaven as our home. That's compassion. People want to argue that Christianity and Christians are too narrow in claiming that Jesus is the only way to God. But in reality, it is wide enough to save the whole world. If the world chooses to accept Christ and repent of their sins, they can have salvation. And instead of worrying about how limited it sounds... We should be shouting, thank God for providing such a sure and clear way for me to have heaven as my home. That's what we need to be doing. And as Christians, we need to make that crystal clear to the world. We're so afraid of the world and their world's rejection that we want to downplay the exclusivity of Christ. But this is the means of salvation and hope. We have nothing in have it in no other, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. A man drowning at sea doesn't respond to the lifeline that is thrown out there to him. Well, you know what? I want a few extra options. I don't like the red rope. I want a green rope. He's glad to just grab his means of salvation and get hauled to safety. 
And so it should be with everyone as we present to them the gospel. Jesus' exclusive claim is unmistakable. It it forces an unconditional response. Jesus, the apostles in the church today, invite you either to accept him or reject him. There's no middle ground with Jesus, and that's why he says it in such stark terms. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Either you accept me and have eternal life, or you reject me. He's not going to make you. And so we as the church offer you the same. Here's our means of eternal life, the only hope we have. What are you going to do with it? Well, we gather here today, preacher, so we're believers. I hope that's the case, that every single last one of you here is a believer. You have accepted Christ. You've turned over your life to him, repented of your sins, and trusting him and him alone. Well, there may be some of you who've gathered here and kind of, you're here because you're hedging your bets. (laughs) Uh, In case the Christianity thing is real, I want to come here to church every now and then and make a little contribution to the church and make sure that everything in between me and God's okay so that if it is true, then I have that way. But I'll do some other things and go my way and live my life. Then you haven't been born again. We talk about all in. This is all or nothing with Christ. You don't hedge your bets on him. You believe and trust in him, turn your life over to him. And then there is what? A new birth. In Jesus, you become a new creation. And he transformed you into his likeness. So he is either the only way to God or he is not. And this roadmap that we have been given by God says that he is the only means. He is the only road that leads us to heaven. And there is no other. Let us pray. Father, I ask that as I have preached, you have spoken to our hearts and minds. You've helped us to see through the Holy Spirit's guidance that you are our means of salvation, our only means. And that's not narrow-minded, that is compassionate. I thank you for those who've gathered here today. I pray that we're all believers, but if not, today is the day of salvation for those who have not yet believed. And for those of us who are believers, it reinforces the important truth that we need to take this to the world around us. Graciously and compassionately, but joyously telling them that we know where salvation lies. And through Christ, they can be saved as well. We give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him.